Good morning. My name is Helen Christians, and I want to welcome you this morning to the HGP Sunday morning meeting here at Friendly House. Uh, our speaker is in person, and so is your MC this morning. And humanism is a system of thought attaching primary importance to human experiences and the wonder of the natural world rather than supernatural beliefs. Humanists stress the potential value and goodness of all human beings, emphasize common human needs, and attempt to solve the problems they encounter by staying curious and open to the thoughts of others, and, 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 but also speaking their own truth through the pillars of science, reason, and free inquiry. All right. Well, I'm ready to introduce our wonderful speaker. And uh, Professor David Horowitz has taught U.S. culture and political history at Portland State University since 1968. That's 55, 55 years? Something like Something that. Something like that. <laughs> and his publications include Beyond Left and Right, um, Insurgency and the Establishment, America's Political Class Under Fire, The 20th Century's Great Culture Wars, the People's Voice, a populist cultural history of modern America, and his most recent book, and really what we're going to be looking at today, Inside the Clavern, the secret history of a Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s, which is an annotated collection of the proceedings of the uh, Lagrand here in Oregon, uh, KK chapter. Dr. Horowitz, thank you so much. It's an honor to have you speak to us this morning on the Ku Klux Klan and the modern culture wars. Welcome. So glad thank you're you. here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It really is a pleasure to be here and so many people here live. That's great. My talk is called The Second Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s, White Nationalism, and the origins of American culture war. You're looking at a march of Ku Klux Klansmen, 40,000 Klansmen and women in Washington, D.C., as you can tell from the Capitol in the background, in 1925. That march actually marked the peak of Klan influence in the United States. But our story starts with Oregon. In December 1921, Reverend Reuben Sawyer, formerly of Portland's East Side Christian Church, spoke before 6,000 people at the Municipal Auditorium with Mayor George Baker in the audience. Sawyer had a reputation as a white nationalist, a critic of the Jews, and an opponent of the Roman Catholic Church. He had come to address, as his title indicated, the truth about the invisible empire of the Ku Klux Klan. This was a movement that would enroll up to six million native-born white Protestant American men and women throughout the decade of the 1920s white supremacy and Anglo-Protestant ethnocentrism were of course not new in US history. Similar notions frame the displacement and enslavement of Native Americans, buttress the African slave labor system that provided America's main source of colonial wealth, marginalized Irish Catholic migrants, as criminals and paupers before the Civil War, and caricatured African Americans as unworthy of citizenship amid the imposition of Southern segregation codes, black male disenfranchisement, and racial violence from the 1890s on. Meanwhile, late 19th century labor activists on the West Coast laid the foundation for the termination of Chinese and Japanese immigration, while patrician racial theorists expressed an elite form of white nationalism by <laughs> demonizing Roman Catholic, Orthodox Christian, and Jewish immigrants from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe as beaten men from beaten races. 
the 1920s did not mark the initial appearance of the Ku Klux Klan. The first Klan, organized after the Civil War by former Confederate officers, arose as a secret vigilante order, deploying murder and terrorism to intimidate former slaves from asserting economic or political autonomy while targeting the occupying Union Army and its political allies. Its professed goals involved the purity of white womanhood and assertions of Southern sovereignty. Although disbanded by federal troops in the 1870s, the first Klan originated the hoods, the masks, the robes, and several of the official titles and secret passwords and rituals adopted by its successors. Klux, by the way, was Greek for circle. Ku, K-U, was a made up word. William Joseph Simmons, an itinerant Methodist preacher and fraternal society promoter, organized the second Klan at a nighttime ceremony on Thanksgiving night on George's Stone Mountain in 1915. The gathering coincided with the Atlanta premiere of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, the popular silent motion picture celebrating the advent of the first Klan in the South. Borrowing the racial caricatures and myth of the lost cause from Griffith's film, Smith envisioned a nostalgic organization celebrating white supremacy and the Confederacy. Two years earlier, Georgia populist and newspaper publisher Tom Watson, Watson had called for a new Klan to protect what he called Southern home rule after the governor had commuted the death sentence of Leo Frank, a Jewish factory manager, falsely accused of the murder of Mary Fagan, a young Gentile female employee. employee. Watson's demagoguery inspired a mob to abduct Leo Frank from the prison farm holding him. The mob took him to Fagan's hometown and hung him. Seeking enhanced KKK recruitment in 1920, Simmons hired two publicity agents. The unmarried Atlanta couple devised a pyramid scheme in which professional recruiters called Klegels earned a share of initiation fees. Within a year, the movement had spread from Georgia to the booming oil towns of Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. In response, exposés conducted by the New York World newspaper and the House Rules Committee in Washington accused Southwest Klansmen of whippings, brandings, and vigilante action against morals offenders. When Klan leaders diffused the charges, the resulting publicity popularized the order. By 1922, when Texas Grand Dragon Hiram Wesley Evans wrested control of the organization from Simmons, the Klan had spread to the Middle West, Pacific Coast, and Northeast. Two-fifths of its es estimated two million members at that time came from Illinois, Indiana, or Ohio. Under Evans's leadership, the movement cultivated an enlarged constituency as a fraternal order, a patronage machine to provide jobs, and a national purity lobby. Klan appeals focused on so-called 100% Americanism. That was actually a slogan invented by the American Legion Veterans Organization. 
The Klan appeal also focused on traditional, quote, Protestant values of individualism and democracy. Its chapters offered free membership to Protestant clergy, engaged in local charity activities and community service, professing allegiance to the American flag, the Constitution, and the Bible. The movement endorsed prohibition, immigration quota, uh, an immigration quota system, federal aid to public schools to Americanize youth, and efforts to clean up urban crime and political graft. Klan rhetoric embraced prevailing racial stereotypes of African Americans. Yet the organization discouraged anti-Negro violence and as a supporter of law enforcement, took credit for declining lynching rates in the Southern states. Meanwhile, Klan periodicals denounced hyphenated Americans in the immigrant community, deemed incapable of assimilating the values of the nation's Anglo-Protestant founders. Much of this rhetoric conveyed a profound sense of loss and nostalgia for an imagined golden era before the influx of the new immigration that comes to the country between 1880 and 1920. With nearly one third of the nation's white population comprised of immigrants or their children Anti-immigration was a mainstream issue endorsed by the job conscious labor movement, by business interests, anxious about foreign radicalism, by civic and veterans organizations, and by outright advocates of native born supremacy. It's extremely difficult today to penetrate a mindset that sees the 20s KKK in purely racial terms. Yet the period's Klan portrayed what they called the group mind and alien ideas introduced by Catholics and Jews as the real threat. Imperial wizard Hiram Wesley Evans held immigrants and their liberal defenders responsible for the abandonment of moral standards surrounding the home, decency, patriotism, and yes, race. A decline attributed to the lack of a homogeneous population required for a great nation. The Nordic American, declared Evans, was, quote, a stranger in large parts of the land his fathers gave him one much spit upon. Evans's rhetoric mirrored the sentiments of right-wing populism through the twin corruption of cultural elites, the cosmopolitan intelligentsia, given to legitimizing tolerance and diversity. We're talking about a perception of twin sources of corruption as 20s clan leaders perceived it. The first was the cultural elite, the cosmopolitan intelligentsia, given to legitimizing tolerance and diversity. And the second was the so-called underclass, whether immigrants or ethnic minorities, who allegedly threatened middle-class values of propriety. The Klan appeared to be responding to the so-called acids of modernity, defining the jazz age, the increasing importance of secular science, of cosmopolitan values, which accept people from different backgrounds, of self-indulgent consumerism, and enhanced roles for women youth and urban minorities. One by one, said Evans, all our traditional moral standards went by the boards. Evans noted the sacredness of our Sabbath, 
of our homes of chastity, and finally, even of our right to teach our children in our schools fundamental facts and truths. Those who maintain the old standards, he wrote, did so only in the face of constant ridicule. Mark Twain has very recently been quoted as saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I think you can appreciate <laughs> the validity of that brilliant statement made over a century ago in regard to the so-called clan values and postures in relation to some of the developments in our own time period. The clan would succeed, claimed Evans, because its appeal was emotional and instinctive rather than coldly intellectual and because it could be trusted more than, quote, the fine-haired reasoning of the denatured intellectuals. Like humanists. <laughs> Writing in the North American Review, a mainstream magazine in 1926, Evans proudly accepted the caricature of Klansmen as, quote, hicks and rubes and dryers, drivers of secondhand Fords, the plain people, he claimed, who represented, quote, the average citizen of the old stock. As an emerging corporate economy eroded the status of independent professionals and merchants, Evans bemoaned the fact that much of our great cities and control of industry and commerce had been, quote, taken over by strangers who stacked the cards of success and prosperity against us. You own this country, he told a gathering of regional clan officers in 1923. If you propose to allow anyone to take it away from you, it can mean nothing to you. Klan discourse echoed Henry Ford's anti-Semitic The International Jew, a pamphlet he published at his own expense in 1922. By portraying Jews as crass materialists and middlemen lacking in public spirit and clinging to a tribal identity. Catholics came under fire from other sources for alleged subservience to an old world priesthood and papal hierarchy, to parochial schools that preach dogmatism and subservience to authority, and to urban corruption, vice, and crime. From Buffalo, New York, to Youngstown, Ohio, to Denver, to Sacramento, to Portland, Klan leaders attributed bootlegging, prostitution, and the sale of drugs to Romanists and other aliens. These purity issues appeal to the women's auxiliaries and independent women organizations that made up a fifth of the movement's following in the 1920s. In fact, the women, the clans women were the strongest force to the pursuit of purity and revenge and even perhaps vigilante activity by their male counterparts for men who deserted their wives and families, for men who beat their families, for men who were alcoholic and irresponsible. The very important part of the Klan movement is this moral outrage at the, uh, the violations of decorum and decency uh, within the family structure by white men who were the main focus of such activism. Klan chapters across the country also turned to local and state elections, economic boycotts, whispering campaigns. Did you know that so-and-so was a secret Catholic? Do not vote for them. And intimidating public demonstrations to counter their professed enemies with a population that was 85% white and native born, 90% Protestant, and less than 8% Roman Catholic, 
with a long tradition of nativism, Oregon provided fertile ground for the secret order. First surfacing in Medford in 1921, the Oregon clan boasted a statewide following of 14,000 people within a year. Organizers used the membership lists of Protestant churches and fraternal groups like the Masons. In the university town of Eugene, the secret order enrolled 400 members by mounting a campaign to oppose a campus branch of the Catholic Newman Club. Another technique involved the presentation of anti-Catholic public lectures in schools and public auditoriums by Protestant clergy, such as Reuben Sawyer, who I began this discussion with. Other clerical speakers included Dr. James R. Johnson, former pastor of the Selwood Christian Church and the presiding officer of the Portland clan, who liked to tell audiences that Catholic priests fathered the children in the church's orphanages. The only way to convert a priest, he would say to widespread laughter among his audience, was to kill him. V.K. Bearcat, Bear, excuse me, Bearcat, the one-time minister of the Lebanon Oregon Christian Church and the most popular anti-Rome lecturer in the state, equated Catholic immigrants with the illiterate and criminal element of Southern and Eastern Europe. By 1923, one report listed 60 Klan chapters in nearly every population center of Oregon, including Portland, which had 60% of the nation of the statewide membership. Here is a picture of a march in Ashland, right down the main street. These were public demonstrations. These were to be examples of town pride to clean up corruption and crime. Here is a gathering in Lane County, one there in Eugene on the left, and the other somewhere else at an outdoor nighttime ceremony. Altogether, a total of 50,000 Oregonians may have passed through the Klan during the 1920s, not all at one time because people often very quickly left and quickly got disillusioned, but new members came in and kind of recycling. It's important to understand how normal membership in the 20s clan was. As one visiting journalist commanded, commented, it was not the bad people of the state, but the good people, the very good people, largely responsible for the transformation of the Oregon Commonwealth into an invisible empire. This organization was created for Protestants. The secretary of the Legrand clan chapter wrote in the chapter minutes, and if you are an honorable citizen and believe in a strict enforcement of the law, then you owe your support to this clan. In August, 1921, Portland Mayor George Baker posed for a photo with the chief of police, the county sheriff, the district attorney, the U.S. attorney, and a special agent of the U.S. Justice Department for a newspaper photograph with two fully robed and hooded Oregon Klan leaders following a law and order meeting. Actually, the two Klansmen tricked the group into posing in, with this photograph. Just as the camera was ready, was ready to shoot, the two Klan leaders rushed back, changed into their Klan robes, and then came out. The other members may not even have known <laughs> who they were posing this photograph. They knew they were Klansmen, but not in uniform. George Baker, the mayor, who, by the way, was a former theater owner, and Governor Walter Pierce later participated in a so-called patriotic dinner honoring Oregon Grand Dragon, Fred Gifford. The order celebrated the 1923 Rose Festival, 
with its first Portland outdoor initiation of members. And this happened in towns all over the state. As with Mount Tabor, the ceremonial location on Mount Scott, where the initiation was held, was a favorite site of cross burnings designed to dramatize Klan presence. Cross burnings were not for the 20s Klan a signal for vigilante action against helpless minorities. They were simply a symbol of the Klan presence in a community. More ominously, however, Mayor Baker distributed city police badges to 100 Klan vigilantes to monitor so-called undesirables. The Klan's Black Patrol reportedly rounded up four boxcars of striking members of the radical industrial workers of the world that year and ran them out of town. Klan political muscle in Oregon helped elect mayors, city commissioners, judges, justices of the peace, chiefs of police, school board members, and state legislators. In an interview in the spring of 1922, an emboldened Grand Dragon Gifford outlined the Klan's agenda in the state. Mobilization against the control of public affairs by aliens, opposition to land ownership by foreigners, and support of a compulsory public education ballot initiative. Klan influence helped elect Eastern Oregon Democrat Walter Pierce, a tax reforming populist and Klan sympathizer as governor in 1922. Pierce worked with Klan supported state legislators to pass the Garb Act, which outlawed the wearing of religious habit by public school teachers aimed at the nuns, and the Alien Land Act, which banned Japanese and Chinese immigrants who were ineligible for citizenship from owning landed property in the state. Promoting the Klan as an agent of Protestant solidarity in commerce and the workplace, officers invoked the order's oath of clannishness to discourage patronage of Catholic or Jewish businesses. Communities across Oregon featured TWK, trade with Klansmen signs in the windows of shops. Portland Klan leaders even helped publish a 100% directory of businesses run by native-born Protestants. In La Grande, the chapter voted to require a reading of right businesses at every meeting, although the secretary reportedly called out, repeatedly called out members for violating economic solidarity by patronizing the favorite, their favorite Catholic or Jewish businesses. A particular controversial place was Herman's Lunch Counter run by a German Catholic down by the uh, railroad station in La Grande. And everybody went there for lunch because the food was good and cheap. And so the Klan secretary in his minutes would continually call out, so-and-so was seen at Herman's lunch counter or at the Roche garage owned by Herman Roche, a German Catholic uh, proprietor in town. They constantly were trying to keep people, their members away from these businesses which were not right. Uh, a Klan grocer was supposed to be patronized, uh, but um, the goods were cheaper at the so-called Hooverized grocery store, uh, which was run by a Jew <laughs> that emulated the efficiency methods of Herbert Hoover from when he had been the food administrator during World War I. It was complicated <laughs> to enforce this kind of solidarity among the ranks. Control of public education reflected the focus of Imperial Wizard uh, Evans, who described the public schools as, quote, the most essential of all American institutions, the foundation of Protestant spirituality and American democracy. The national organization lobbied for federal aid to education through a cabinet-ranked agency in Washington that could take on massive illiteracy, require instruction in the English language, and ensure the Americanization 
of immigrant children and consequent national unity. In La Grande, the agenda coincided with an effort to purge Catholic influence from the public schools. The Klan successfully promoted the replacement of the school board's Catholic clerk with, quote, a 100% American and engineered the firing of a Catholic school teacher just on the basis of her religious affiliation. Yet the Klan's greatest victory came on election day, 1922, the same election that elected Walter Pierce with passage of the Oregon Compulsory Public School Ballot Initiative approved by nearly 53% of the electorate. The measure required parents to send children between the ages of eight and 16 to public schools. The proposal came out of a resolution of the Scottish Rite Masons, attesting to free and compulsory public education in the English language as the only sure foundation for the perpetuation of free institution. The voters' pamphlet statement to support the measure, inserted by the Masons, pleaded that children should not be divided into antagonistic groups in a citizenship of, quote, cliques, cults, and, fac and factions. Cliques, cults, and factions that would defy national unity. In a letter to the Oregonian, gubernatorial candidate Pierce argued, we would have a better generation of Americans free from snobbery and bigotry if all children were educated in the public schools. Although the Klan did not officially endorse the school bill, its leaders supported it and joined William Uren, father of the Oregon system of ballot initiatives and referendum. In echoing Pierce's populist argument, the Klan was just as opposed to private academies as to denominational schools, Grand Dragon Gifford told the Oregon Voter magazine. But Catholic academies were signaled out as agents of a, quote, dogmatic faith incompatible with American values. Oregon Klansmen mounted auto cavalcades, spelled with a K, whose drivers honk their horns when they pass parochial schools, or who distributed Klan pamphlets in front of Catholic churches. Klan power, however, was never ubiquitous. Inside the, pu the Protestant community or elsewhere, it's a really important point. Republican State Senator Bruce Dennis, publisher and editor of the Le Grand Evening Observer, printed editorials on the malign influence of, quote, secret societies and publicly denounced Klansmen as breeders of trouble. Salem Capital Journal editor Harry Crane charged that the secret order was responsible for the spread of racial and religious prejudices. He ran in a series of articles exposing Klan divisiveness. The school bill, said Crane, was designed for no other purpose than to strike at the Catholics. Portland's Evening Telegram newspaper published a widely circulated editorial cartoon depicting a hooded Klansman holding a sign that read, State Monopoly of the Schools is an Absolute Success in Russia, meaning Communist Russia. <laughs> Other critics came from Jewish, mainstream Lutheran, Seventh-day Adventist, Presbyterian, and Methodist leaders. Klansmen did not operate in a country that was overwhelmingly sympathetic to their methods or even their principles. A Klan march 
outside of Homestead, Pennsylvania, steel making center of the country in a town called Carnegie. <laughs> Wound up with a shootout in which a Klansman was murdered by Italian American steel workers, furious about the Klan's propaganda. In Ohio's Niles Valley, which is where Youngstown is, another steel making center, a riot broke out between marching Klansmen and local steel workers, mainly Italian and Polish American Catholics. There was never a free field for Klan activities. Catholic priests in Portland and Bend were courageous defenders of their right to practice their religion and confronted Klan speakers and defenders at public lectures, both in Portland and Bend. When Reuben Sawyer, who, <clears throat> excuse me, I started this conversation with, returned to the Municipal Auditorium in Portland in May of 1922, the Oregonian reported that police sought to maintain order by preventing speeches from nearly 2,000 anti-Klan protesters outside the building. In June, Archbishop Alexander Christie, the head of uh, the Catholic Church hierarchy in the Portland area, organized a Catholic Civil Rights Association of Oregon. <clears throat> to lobby against the school bill that was coming up for a vote. Seeking a broad coalition, Christie created an executive committee, including 30 statewide business and community leaders that sent speakers to every county with the message that the school ballot initiative threatened the rights of all parents to determine their child's education. The most inadmissible of human rights, the association declared. Even when the school bill passed, remember, with 53% of the vote, Archbishop Christie and the clergy organized a Catholic Truth Society to sponsor public talks and place articles in newspapers across the state, including a Catholic question and answer box in the Oregonian. We should take the public more into our confidence by letting them know more about us, the society's leader told the Catholic Sentinel. Christie also convened a meeting of the bishops of the ecclesiastical province in Seattle to solicit financial backing from the National Catholic Welfare Council to mount a legal challenge to the school bill initiative. With additional support from both the Knights of Columbus and the American Civil Liberties Union, attorneys for the Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary, which ran Catholic educational institutions in Oregon and still does, the group filed suit in 1923 for a temporary injunction to block implementation of the school bill. Months later, a three-judge panel of the Federal District Court ruled that the initiative deprived school operators of property without due process and abridged the liberties and rights of conscience of parents and teachers. This case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. In Sisters Pierce versus Sister, excuse me, Pierce versus Society of Sisters in 1925, the court unanimously upheld the district court ruling that said that the school bill violated constitutional rights. This was a landmark case <laughs> in the history of American pluralism. Two months after that court decision, 40,000 hooded and robed Klansmen and women marched in Washington, D.C. That was that picture that I had up at the start of our talk. The Klan's influence peaked shortly after that march. 
you could call it its dying whimper in the 1920s. Klan membership sank some 80% by the end of that year. A series of moral and financial scandals among Klan leaders, financial burdens on members who had to pay dues and buy robes and send all their money to the Atlanta National Headquarters, lingering vigilantism in the South, usually targeting white morals offenders, anti-Catholic campaigns in local communities, which were extremely disruptive, and the resolution of the immigration issue in 1924 with a federal law creating a quota system, the National Origins Act, that favored Northwestern Europeans and penalized immigrants from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe, mainly Catholic, Orthodox, and Jewish migrants. All of these factors took their toll. There's no one reason why the Klan begins to lose members. It was more trouble than it was worth. <laughs> The recruitment of members was based on pursue your patriotic duty, your community duty, clean up your community, be a good citizen, join this organization, which is a benevolent society. And a lot of people who joined the Klan were really <laughs> tricked by that and became disillusioned in many cases with the rank prejudice, the childishness of Klan campaigns particularly against Catholics. Grand Dragon Gifford had his own problems. He faced a succession of chapters in Salem, Pendleton, and elsewhere. Local Klan leaders accused Gifford of dictatorial methods, of misappropriation of funds, and charges, and this may have been the most damning charge, that his wife was Catholic. And that two of his daughters attended St. Mary's Academy across from Portland State in, in Portland. Gifford soon left the remnants of the Oregon clan. He tried to resurrect the order in the 1930s, but it went nowhere. Although a few clans targeted activists in the Alabama, targeted Jewish labor activists, in the Alabama and Georgia Piedmont during the 1930s in the area of textile and cotton mills, Klan activity in the 1930s, in the late 30s, was overshadowed by anti-Semitic and proto-fascist organizations, such as Father Coughlin's Christian Front. Father Coughlin was the famous radio priest from Royal Oak, Michigan. In the early 1930s, his radio sermons on Sunday were the most popular program that you could find on um, the radio broadcast networks. But by the later 1930s, after he had sponsored a third party trying to unseat Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1936 that fell on its face, Coughlin increasingly turned to conspiracies about international bankers, by which he meant Jewish international bankers, and began to mimic the propaganda line of Radio Berlin in Nazi Germany and uh, radio broadcasts coming from Rome uh, where the fascist Mussolini had taken power. Father Coughlin created the Christian Front, which in areas of Boston and New York wound up recruiting young men to smash the windows of Jewish businesses. Gerald Winrod's Defenders of the Christian Faith Another demagogue of the late 30s and early 1940s, pursuing a basically white nationalist program. And William Pe Pe excuse me, William Pelly's silver shirts, who were literally fascists, self-styled fascists. <coughs> These groups demonized Jews as symbols of urban liberalism, collectivism, and internationalism. The tiny United Brotherhood of America known as the Black Legion, even called out Franklin D. Roosevelt's Jew deal. Polling indicated 
by the late 30s and early 40s, that 31% of Americans saw Jews as less patriotic than other people, um, than other Americans. 41% thought Jews had too much power. A survey in 1940 found that 17% believed Jews were a national menace. During World War II, sympathizers open, openly bonded with overseas fascist and Nazi enemies, although the Ku Klux Klan itself disbanded somewhere around 1944. The second Klan disbanded. Since 1945, a variety of racist, patriot, militia, and white nationalist organizations, including new versions of the Ku Klux Klan, have railed against immigration, globalism, multiculturalism, gun safety measures, and cosmopolitan, quote, decadence. The advent of the internet in the 1990s provided an unprecedented platform for these groups. This includes neo-Nazi profit-making websites such as Stormfront, which supposedly had 300,000 followers at one point. The Daily Stormer, another one. And the traditional youth network that mobilized support for, quote, white pride and struggles for, quote, faith, family, and folk. Others, such as Patriot Prayer, the Oath Keepers, and the Proud Boys have engaged in alt-right, alternative right mobilizations in Portland, Boise, and notoriously Charlottesville, Virginia, and the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 1921. Some online sites operate with encrypted messages that evade monitoring of their contents. Others, such as internet entrepreneurs Alex Jones, and Breitbart News Network, Mr. Stephen Banyan, proselytize against the deep state and the new world order with conspiracy-minded rants spiked with elements of male sexual and gender paranoia. Toleration for diversity, the hallmark of the cosmopolitan political class, becomes a center for white genocide, according to these sources, propelled by, quote, cultural Marxists. These notions have reached an extreme, extreme proportion in QAnon and evangelical fantasies that an authoritarian savior like Donald Trump can rescue America from socialism, liberal decadence, attacks on religion, on-demand abortion, satanic child pornography rings, elitist media, and rigged elections. The danger is that an internet and right-wing media-generated movement that feeds on a sense of victimization and betrayal can inspire individual acts of violence against real or imagined adversaries, as attacks on federal sites, black churches, synagogues, abortion clinics, nonviolent protests, trans nightclubs, and targeted individuals have shown. Hate speech can lend itself to repercussions by either unstable lone wolves or organized entities. This was Randy Weaver responsible for the shootout with federal agents at Ruby Ridge in Montana. Timothy McVeigh responsible for the Oklahoma City, uh, the bombing of the federal uh, center in uh, Oklahoma City. 
with over well over 100 casualties. Dylan Roof, who walked into a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, where he was asked to pray with the, the congregants and shot to death several people because blacks were replacing whites. Other than reliance on well-funded law enforcement, and I do say well-funded law enforcement, and the courts, the response to these provocations may not be as clear as we might like. At the same time, threats to liberal democracy emerge in the conspiratorial mindsets and attractions to autocracy that some marginal voices are seeking to normalize. Some of those voices within the political structure of the country. The risk is that an electorate exhausted by an enervating pandemic, globalist economic instability, and radical shifts in gender and cultural norms may find credibility in politicians who rant against politically correct speech, identity politics, multicultural education, transsexual competitors in school sports, open borders, rampant crime, and rigged elections. The 1920s Klan offers us a preview of the culture wars that may help us negotiate these challenges. Hiram Wesley Evans embodied a classic case of modern alienation a roadmap to understanding alleged victimization in the face of hostile forces. Fearful that uncontrolled societal change contributed to the loss of what Klansmen referred to as character in the 1920s, Klan defenders of moral tradition and defenders of their own social status, abandoned faith in teachers, opinion molders, liberal politicians, and educated elites that were tied to threatening cultural innovation. The sin lay not as much with the innovations themselves as with those who defended them and disparaged their detractors. It's important to acknowledge that antagonism to remote or imagined elites seem to have had more to do with the fleeting appeal of the 1920s Klan and even hostility to immigrants, Jews, or Catholics. Nor, as I've tried to suggest to you, does race offer a distinctive lens for examining the second KKK, no matter how deeply that association is embedded in many minds today. Although 20s Klan followers and today's extremists may share a racial view of the world, in fact, it may be the organizing premise of their behavior and expression, it's important, I think, to understand that both have fed upon a degree, a deeper reservoir of alienation, spiked by the disrespect they perceive in well educated and professional circles. If I'm right, that psychological issues lie at the heart of contemporary extremism, people of goodwill need to quarantine that appeal. Beyond mobilizing a base of liberals and progressives, this requires reaching out to about 40% of non-affiliated voters in this country with what I would call a popular front dedicated to minimal standards of democracy. To do that, leaders and activists must adv advocate political goals in the common interests, avoid shaming, avoid virtue signaling, avoid narrow appeals to supporters that don't have broad appeal. 
A perfect example of coalition building emerged in Archbishop Christie's ecumenical response to the Oregon Compulsory Public Education Bill. Exactly 100 years after that, pro-democracy candidates for secretaries of state and key battleground contests recently succeeded in defeating rivals who cast doubt on the integrity of elections not going their way. At the same time, newly elected governors in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Arizona and several victorious Senate candidates appealed to voters by expressing the desire to solve practical problems that touch people's lives, including the right of women to make personal health choices. By treating the electorate with honesty and respect, they personified the existence of democracy on the ballot. Political observers such as John Meacham have noted that the United States has a recurring history of stumbling through crises. It would be a terrible time to see disaffection, divisiveness, and disinformation become so entrenched that a multicultural democracy doesn't die so much as fade away. As frightening as the specter of democracy may appear in the darker corners of the political universe, a good deal of the remedy may lie with passionate but humble advocates for the preservation of government of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you very much. Dr. Horowitz, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And we have a question from Joyce Lackey. How much of the current white supremacy uh, nationalism is actually a partial response to the rise of women in society. Males left with nothing constructive to do. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? That there's the rise of women in um, in in this in society, more roles. Uh, Portland State just hosted a couple of weeks ago a guest speak a guest talk by Michelle Goldberg of the New York Times, whose topic was um, autocracy and gender, mm -hmm. which was exactly her thesis. Her thesis was that one of the common denominators of autocracy movements across the planet are the denigration of the autonomy and agency of women. That in some respects, autocracy always falls back on male prerogative because it has this sense of embattlement and the best symbol of that for many of these people is the increased posture and presence and agency of women. So it's a very important theme. That's why I put in that uh, line about um, election deniers who want to deny the right of women to make <laughs> health, health, choices. health choices. That's a very important part of it. It backfired <laughs> quite a bit. Al Christians here at Friendly House has a question. You mentioned uh, the Black Legion. And I've seen the movie. Oh, yeah. I haven't read the book about Detroit, but I understand that they cop they captured it as a member of the uh, police chief of Detroit, and they had some influence with professional <clears throat> athletes or something. But it brings me to law enforcement. The movie, The FBI Story, shows Jimmy Stewart, and it, it's essentially a history of the Klan, or of the FBI, and it shows Jimmy Stewart locking up a whole bunch of Klan's guys and hauling them off to jail. And I believe that would be was said in the period of the new clan you're talking about. But I can't find that that story has any truth to it at all. Uh, that most of the other episodes in that movie were all based on true facts, but that one seems to be put in out of fiction for some reason. And I wonder if Hoover ever did anything to the clan or if he laid them off and from your speech, I didn't hear anything that said they were doing a bunch of illegal stuff that maybe they shouldn't have done anything about it. But did the FBI ever do anything to the Klan during this period? And in the sixties, but no, no, I'm you're talking. Yeah. I'm talking about the new Klan period, the twenties when they were all over the country. Oh. oh, did they ever do anything about the Klan at that point, or was the Klan doing anything illegal that they should have done anything about? Thank you, Al. <laughs> the um, the vigilante action that occurred 
was very much in, in, in localized settings and very particular so that it wouldn't have been an issue for the FBI in the 1920s. And um, Evans there in Atlanta tried to suggest that the Klan was a law abiding organization that respected law enforcement. So the idea of local vigilante action impeded his desire to legitimize the Klan as a national political movement. And to some extent, he was successful in doing that. Although there remained isolated incidents of, of vigilante action, although they were, as I said, mainly directed at white, offend, white male offenders of, of purity codes. Um, but the Klan in the um, 60s was infiltrated by the FBI um, in Mississippi and elsewhere. Uh, um, and uh, although critics didn't think <laughs> the Klan did, uh, the FBI did as much as they could have, but uh, that became a, a major impediment to Klan organization. And it should note that um, really since uh, the 1960s and 70s, the, the Klan has just dissipated into small local units. And in the alt-right movement, Klansmen are considered, you know, you're so yesterday, <laughs> you're so passe, you know, it's an old fashioned organization, old fashioned identities have been completely usurped, you know, by, uh, you know, private proud boys and oath keepers and, you know, Breitbart and all of these kind of movements. Um, so I don't know about that was supposed to be in the 1920s that Jimmy Stewart was throwing Klansmen into now, I, I've read something, and I've never really got that Donald Trump's father was arrested at a Klan rally in Queens and jailed <laughs> in, in the 1920s. So I don't know what that was about, you know, and and, and why there would have been an arrest. I, I just don't know. Yeah. You know. Those are the World War II groups that I was kind of mentioned in passing. Yeah. There's a comment from uh, Robert Sanford. Isn't it ridiculous that the mega crowd likes to display the two main flags of racist losers, the Nazi flag and the Confederate flag? Yep. Um, Leslie has, uh, Haggard has a, a question. Does the formal self-identifying KKK exist now here or anywhere? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. it, it, it fell apart into localized groups and it, it, it almost very little profile right now. Oh, there's a there's, question. That doesn't mean racism is <laughs> right. right. Um, there's a question from Friendly House. Uh, Maida? Maida. Maida. Um, although you're ending, you know, how do we deal with this? How can we gently try to shift and deal with and, you know, the, the disenfranchised folks? And yet it's time to bust the myth that most Trump voters actually were not working class people. Right. Middle class and upper class. That's right. Love the autocratic, love yeah. the fascist. I get it. They're trying to keep their power, right? That's the basis of, yeah. of how they would vote. But again, what? How would be? How would we deal with a populist that's functioning at that level? I mean, there is no sort of warm-hearted. How can no. we? Are oh. you <laughs> saying the forty percent of non-affiliated American oh. voters, so-called independent? I don't know. You can't latch on to every word. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, independence in elections and so forth. Right. Oh. You know, you know, um, I, I, I'm a, I, I'm very political. You know, but I have to realize that most Americans are not very political. I want to be left alone. You know, don't bother me with it. You know, just don't make it difficult for my family and my children. You know, just leave us alone. You know. 40% of the electorate is pretty non-political or, or independent. Those are the people I'm talking about. They are the balance of power. In my, in my view, there's maybe 30% MAGA and 30% progressive liberal, you know, and the rest is the 40%. <laughs> Quick question. Um, is it always going to be like this? Anytime a country is just striving toward pluralism, the chaos will just be this kind of tribalism. Other countries, they are much more selective in who is allowed in, who is allowed out. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, because it's more homogeneous, oh, well, don't we have a um, calmer society or whatever it is, you know, a country. Mm -hmm. um, America is is the testing ground for having people come together. And it yeah. just doesn't seem to be doing a good job at all throughout the years. It ain't, as, it ain't as bad as it could be. That's true. I mean, we don't have massive massacres in the streets. 
you know, <laughs> there, there are certain countries we can name, you know. <laughs> we have a question from Mike. Uh, is there a connection between current white nationalists and the Constitutional uh, Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, uh, Oregon chapter. Oh, I don't know much about that, but I have seen so, some references to that. There definitely is an issue in much of white nationalism is focused in rural America. And there's long explanations probably for that. But I think it's the same for law enforcement and sheriffs <laughs> in rural America, um, that is a problem. And um, there are sheriffs who right, don't want to support the new Oregon gun safety law. They say they won't. They won't. You know, um, it's part of the culture of the regions they represent. <laughs> and um, they won't go against it. And I don't know exactly you know, what the response to that is, except that people have to respect them. Law enforcement officials must carry out the law or face, you know, penalties. Let's see, we have a question from Susan. I believe this is a timely subject and discussion given the reports of former president whose name I avoid um, <laughs> having entertained a Nazi, uh, right. a Nazi denier. Uh, I think it's De, uh, Flunte, David Fluntes and uh, an anti-Semite, uh, yay. They were asked, I saw a clip, they asked Joe Biden, what do you think about that? He said, you don't want to hear what I think about that. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, no, I, I do have another response. Uh, this morning we were watching uh, Jonathan Capehart on MSNBC who had his Aunt, Aunt Gloria on, this really solid um, African-American lady from North Carolina. He said, Aunt Gloria, I wanted to ask you about that dinner that the, the former president had. She said, it, it was the Three Stooges. That is really a good response. <laughs> Much better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> Aunt Gloria. You know, he I says, you've got to come to Washington, he said, and you know, come live on my show. And I was, I said, no, I was screaming at the television. No, she needs, Biden needs to invite her to the White House as an advisor. <laughs> How do you handle the, I'm sure the interactions that you may come, come in contact with, with people who are of the persuasion that white, you know, that our country is going to hell. We've got to protect our borders. We, you know, this is a problem. I mean, that. How do you handle when you encounter someone like that? Or what do you do? Uh, I, I don't know if there can be much of a conversation with those people. Yeah, I, I, my tactic is to isolate them, as I said, by appealing to the good faith of most Americans who maybe, whether they're political or not political, kind of believe that democracy isn't a bad idea right. <laughs> and that people should obey, abide by the results of a democratic election, you know? Right. Um, so uh, it's just sort of a black hole to get in that kind of conversation with people. Uh, but the fact of it is, the Democrats had a an immigration bill pa uh, that passed the Senate. Um, I forgot what year it was that the House, which was run by the Republicans, refused to take up, and it was an omnibus bill. You'd strengthen the border. You. A, a gesture to the dreamers, a passage to citizenship, you know, right. and all of the things are the holistic bill, but the Republicans wouldn't allow it to come up in the House, you know. So, I mean, there have been efforts, you know, by what you might call progressives and liberals to try to deal with the, the border, which is a mess, right. but you've got to do it in a holistic, also visas for agricultural workers, you know, um, so there have been attempts to deal with it, but have been rebuffed by ideologues on the other side. So I'm not sure there's a very good way of, you know, the border is. A th um, everyone can agree that the border is an issue. And just that the whole idea of um, you know, just being angry that people are taking away jobs when yeah. restaurants are desperate for, desperate for help. And it's just it's I, just so nonsensical that it's yeah. hard I, to argue. I will say that David Newort, who is the 
leading chronicler of the alt-right, a book called The Alt-Right. In the middle of his book, he said, you know, a lot of this hate speech and actions have come in communities where there have been large numbers of immigrants in areas of de decaying economy because of, you know, the loss of manufacturing. So, I mean, there is, there are, there's always a pretext, you know, for someone's rather extreme formulation. Um, to what extent it's, you know, <laughs> relevant is another question, but I, mean, I do mention that, you know, mm -hmm. that it is, um, all these problems of deindustrialization and <laughs> massive immigration, you know, they sort of compound each other, you know, and they're, they're really difficult to deal with. And they don't lend themselves to bumper stickers, you know, <laughs> or, or to ideological, you know, pronouncements. But um, it's hard to say, well, this is very complicated. Yes, Dr. Horowitz, I'm afraid we're going to, would you be willing to stay for afterthoughts? Uh, sure. We just want to sincerely thank you for such a fine lecture. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.